Okay, I was talking to Dr. Ravi. Good evening, all. Uh, here we go on live. Uh, Jitin, uh, YouTube is on. Okay. Um, we welcome everyone to this uh, meeting. We are going through a terrible time. Everybody is hoping and praying things will improve. Each one of us have gone through in a close circle. Um, some mishap has happened. It breaks our heart to see. Uh, our precious ones are you know, losing their lives and have lost their lives. So really open pray, things will improve. And each one of us are in own way doing something to this crisis. And this is another effort to help all of us how we can do something about the crisis to change the situation. Uh, that is how we have organized. We have over 100 uh, volunteers from the Indian Pharmaceutical Association. So they are the inspiration behind this program. They all came and joined, and uh, the CPD, Community Pharmacy Division. That's a group of, uh, no, uh, Dr. Sunita is here, and she will say a little more about them later. So uh, that's how we started this in order to equip them. They said, we are ready, you equip us, and then we are ready to reach out. That is how this webinar is happening. And uh, now I will hand over to our president. Uh, we have actually a board members here, our Foundation for Sustainable Health India. Uh, our president, our vice president, our senior advisor and board member, Dr. Pratima Ma'am is there. Uh, they are very supportive always. I've been working with them for the last 20 years. It's really indeed a privilege to work with them and uh, get their support. Uh, it's really an encouragement. Over to my president, Dr. Ramesh Bilimano. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Chanda. In fact, uh, welcome to all of you and for our Foundation for Sustainable Health India. <laughs> In fact, in this uh, current situation of uh, COVID-19 pandemic, it is not just our political leaders or in other, know, hospitals only play a part. Every citizen, every NGOs in our country has to play th their own role. So also our you know, NGO has taken a lead called I Care, and a call for action. And this is actually a response to the ongoing you know, COVID-19 and a pandemic, and which is actually a public health crisis the whole world is going through, and more so India. The, we are all now you know, flooded with information and many a times myths and misconception. But to highlight and to give a right information, we need the experts who have got their skills and which can really guide us with the right information. We and from our society could be able to understand and there is a gap and between the actual, the COVID warriors who are treating our patients called COVID care management team and the common man you know, in our villages, towns and in the public. And this is our idea to fill up this gap and we need quite a lot of volunteers. It's not just from our society. Our society is only our drop in the big ocean that we can really help. And these people, volunteers, need a right information and so that and they can help others. And this uh, particular you know, the webinar is arranged and for that particular purpose, how best they can be equipped and with this information. Thanks to uh, Dr. Sunita, and who is uh, heading our steering core committee and who is uh, enrolling our volunteer response pool and into this uh, you know, big game and which is needed and for our country. There today, there are four uh, eminent speakers and uh, they're eminent and, and in their own sphere. Dr. Ravi, and a virologist and, and, and from government of Karnataka. Thank you, sir. And Dr. Vijay Lakshmi Balakundre, very well known and pediatric cardiologist and from Jaideva Institute of you know, Cardiology. And Dr. Anand Bhan and from Enapoya. And Dr. Prati Pratima Murthy, Professor in Head and Psychiatry from Nimahans. I welcome all of you, sir, for this webinar. I now hand over to Chandar, our secretary of our society. So thank you, sir, for those kind, word, kind words. Uh, now I would request my co-host, Dr. Sunita, to introduce as first speaker and also uh, about uh, other uh, partners in this um, webinar. And uh, to tell uh, one of Dr. Sunita, I'm surprised to know 
Dr. Sunita was uh, a patient, if I may say, a child patient of Dr. Ramesh. <laughs> Isn't that, I don't know, isn't you were a child when they were, no, he understood, that's what you told me, if I'm getting correctly, uh, your parents were in my soul and then, isn't it? So you knew them from your, uh, Dr. Ramesh and his wife since your childhood, to put it right. Yes, over to Dr. Ramesh Sanita. Thank you so much for the kind introduction and um, uh, having known Dr. Ramesh since the age of seven is one thing, but I'm glad I was not his patient and I don't want to be one. I, knowing him as a mentor is where I would like to go with that. <laughs> So yeah, thanks for this uh, opportunity for uh, bringing in a lot of our volunteers. So where I would try to really um, uh, put the emphasis is on the group called PSPP. Now this is the Parmacon Society for Pharmacy Practice. Dr. Karthik Rakam is the mentor of this particular group and that is exactly where we are getting our close to 75 plus uh, PharmD volunteers. Now, before I get into what our family volunteers are being uh, geared up for, uh, just a few sentences about Dr. Karthik. Uh, he is a clinical pharmacist himself, and uh, he has started several uh, teaching modules for uh, clinical pharmacists so that you know they're getting that particular kind of a training. And where I would like to really uh, emphasize is he's a mentor par excellence, because as a young leader, what he's doing is extremely important. And uh, uh, he's leading uh, the talk rather than talking there. And he also has more than 270, uh, you know, core group of uh, volunteers and mentees. And I'm consistently in touch with them for various parts of the COVID projects that I volunteer for with different organizations. So this is just to put on record uh, the excellent work that uh, Dr. Karthik is doing. And with his support, we are able to bring close to 60 to 75 volunteers uh, that have joined. And what we have been basically doing with the help of Mr. Chandar as well is forming this cohort where we are training these people, mainly for home quarantine part of it. So when pe uh, patients are under home quarantine, what is it that we need to do as motivators to support the home caregivers? And also when patients are discharged from the hospitals, for that one week that they have to be at home and uh, need to be taken care of, then how do we motivate them? How do we take care of uh, whatever support that they need as, uh, you know, uh, whether it is uh, checking on their medication, whether it is any of the frequently asked questions, connecting them to uh, whatever sources that we can do, that is where they are going. So we have already had sessions where uh, Pooja Deshpande, one of the uh, trained psychologists has spoken to us more about how do we train home uh, caregivers, how do we take care of the burnout syndrome and basically you know, create that awareness. Now, what is equally important is if, uh, if this, is surely, this is surely a novel uh, virus, but at least we understand that you know, what are the few things we need to do for preventing the transmission. For a transmittable disease, if we are going through this kind of uh, uh, complications in the second wave, we can only uh, you know, uh, imagine what is going to happen in the forthcoming one. So the more we gear up, the more we bring in the next generation leaders, like Dr. Shivam Shakshi, uh, Sakshi, who is here from uh, Indian Institute of Management, who is a postdoc there, who is also gearing up towards five Gram Panchayat programs. So these are all different volunteers who are sitting here who are doing their bit. And uh, I think it's a good place to uh, acknowledge what they're doing and also to appreciate and uh, basically support them. Now, now we move on to where we are heading today because uh, the four diverse and extremely uh, experienced panelists, uh, it's a blessing to have all of you under one roof for at least the next uh, one and a half hours. What you will be basically helping us out here is in training our volunteers a little better because it is the infodemic which is the bigger part of this crisis along with the pandemic. So uh, first on our uh, uh, panelists is Dr. Ravi, who is a virologist. He is also the nodal officer for the genomic sequencing of the virus. Uh, and he is from the government of Karnataka, Bengaluru. Dr. Ravi, thank you so much for making time for us. And uh, everything that you're investing on us, uh, it is being expanded. So thank you so much for uh, what you're investing in our group. Welcome to your overview, Doctor. You have to please unmute yourself. Let me thank the organizers for having me on this uh panel discussion. I was told uh, I should probably make a short presentation and followed by questions. Is that right? Yes, sir. 10 minutes presentation, sir. And then uh, 
we have two presentation uh, dr vijay lakshmi madam will follow you yeah. and then we will take questions for 20 minutes okay can you see my screen please uh, yes sir okay um i just quickly i was asked to summarize what we have learned so far and uh, this is a novel virus we know it's a corona virus it's called corona because it resembles the crown it has projections on the surface it is found in uh, uh, a variety of human animal and uh, bird species and we also know that prior to the advent of this virus uh, in late 2019 we had two other viruses that also caused uh, severe acute respiratory syndrome they were called the sars and the mers corona we also now know that uh, the new sars cov2 as it is called was a spillover from bats uh, to to an anteater and then human beings probably that occurred in a wet market in wuhan in southern china in december 2019 During the last one year, we have learned a lot about uh, coronavirus epidemiology. We know it's a respiratory virus transmitted by droplets. Droplets, if they are big, uh, they fall because of gravity in three to six feet. They are small. They travel in air. For so initially, it was said that it's droplet infection. Then they revised saying airborne. It is both airborne. when when the droplets are less than 5 microns in diameter they can travel up to 20 30 feet especially in indoor settings and we know mask wearing mask protect if both two people wear mask the chances of transmission is less than 5% more they travel in air from so initially it was said that it's droplet infection oh. then they revised saying airborne it is both airborne when when the droplets are less than 5 microns it's repeating somewhere it's repeating i'm sorry can somebody said that right if both two people wear mask the chances of transmission is less than 5% small they travel in air from so initially it was said that it's droplet infection and they revised saying airborne it is both airborne when when the droplets are less than 5 microns repeating <laughs> there's some problem uh, as i'm speaking it is repeating can somebody said that right please yes sir could sir could you, sir, could you please hold on some may request There's some problem uh, as I'm speaking. It is repeating. Can somebody say that right, please? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Jitin. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Could you please hold on? Sir, may I request? Yes, sir. Our tech person, Jitin. Yes. Yes, sir. Our tech person is helping you, sir. Yeah, Jitin. Yeah, sir. If there is any other device that is carrying out, you can please mute that. There's some problem uh, as I'm speaking. It is repeating. Can somebody say that right, please? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Jitin. Yes, sir. Sir, sir, could you please hold on? Sir, may I? okay when um, two people wear masks irrespective of whether one person is infected or not the chances of transmission are very low less than 5% if the infected person wears mask also the transmission is low if both people don't wear mask the chances of transmission are very high we also knew that from epidemiology that the elderly were the uh, were at highest risk during the first wave mortality was high severity of disease was high in the elderly we also knew that 80 to 90% of people who get the infection were mild or asymptomatic and comorbidities played a major role in uh, the uh, mortality and severity we also knew that symptomatic people transmitted infection more than asymptomatic people the ratio was uh, um, 
1 is to 4. And we also knew that the virus is causing lung disease mainly and disease in various organs, primarily because of the aggressive immune reaction, not because the virus uh, kills uh, cells. So, one of the things that we learned in the first wave was that the second week is very crucial in the illness. We, but from the fifth day to the tenth day is when people deteriorate, if they have to deteriorate. And we know the full range of symptoms, ranging from fever, cold, cough, breathlessness, myalgia, diarrhea, and loss of smell and taste. We also learned that COVID is a multi-system disorder, especially the complications can affect affected. Very quickly, very early in the epidemic, uh, diagnosis was sorted out from the laboratory point. PCR was the diagnostic test. Antibody tests are useless for diagnosis, but they indicate that COVID vaccines came out in a record time of nine months, and we have a variety of vaccines, whole virus vaccines, nucleic acid vaccines, and uh, virus vectored vaccines. And these were released late last year by the end of our first wave. And there was a lot of concern on safety, but these vaccines have been extensively tested in the preclinical phase and the clinical phase. And we know that the vaccines are very safe and the efficacy of these vaccines vary from anywhere from 70% to 95%. And uh, we have uh, uh, about eight vaccines that have been licensed for use across the world. India is using currently two vaccines. One is not listed here, and that is the co-vaccine, which is our own Indian uh, uh, indigenous killed virus, whole virus vaccine, and AstraZeneca, which is a adenovirus-based vector vaccine. Very recently, government has given permission for Sputnik, it is yet to come into the market in India. So with this background, we most people wrote off Corona in, the, in this country, although some of us have been warning that Corona will come back, it will come as a second wave and it will be bigger than the first wave. Why did this occur? And currently we are in the, in the peak of the second wave. The Warnings by scientists and public health people were ignored. Many factors have contributed to the uh, second wave. Primarily, it started a small super spreading events in many urban cities, including Bangalore. And this was because people stopped wearing masks. There was excessive crowding. There were rallies, elections, and religious congregations, which actually was the main reason for the explosion of this uh, outbreak and pandemic in the second wave. The second wave is steeper, bigger, and it caught us unawares because we were not ready for um, the kind of surge and with poor planning in terms of bed availability, in terms of oxygen and essential drugs. Now, different states are going to peak at different time. And of course, the main reason why we are struggling now is the system responded very late. We also knew that by the beginning of this year, very late last year, that virus is uh, mutating. This was again a surprise because nobody expected coronaviruses to mutate uh, as much as it has done. And the mutants started spreading. The first mutant that was recognized was the UK variant. It spread across the globe in a matter of three, four months. Now we have five mutants that are of international concern because they are spreading to many countries. The South African, the Brazilian, the UK were the first three. Earlier we had a Californian mutant and that mutant mutated again to become a double mutant which was just detected in India and we call this the double mutant or the Maharashtra mutant. Now this is spreading very fast and you can see this is the place I picked up this map. It started in India. It is now spread to 46 countries across the globe. It's spreading very fast. 
it's more infectious and that's why the who and public health england have called it variant of concern now what about the, uh, the future this graph this photograph on the left i'm very fond of it's going to be a road with many road humps and we we are likely to have multiple waves of this infection why do i say that look around europe has completed or is in its third wave america is in its fourth wave many asian countries like japan taiwan singapore are in their third wave so we must learn from these lessons and i'm uh, i'm pretty sure that there will be a third wave now what this third wave is going to uh, when is it going to be and what is going to look like uh, generally waves are 3 to 5 months apart after one wave subsides so we we'll have to get ready for the third wave towards the end of this year sars cov2 is a new virus so you will get immunity only through infection or vaccination we know already that vaccination we are not going to be able to uh, vaccinate all our population by this year end because we have a staggering 100 crore adults and of course we don't have a vaccine for children so we have to expect that in the next wave a large proportion of them will be children we will also have the same number of adults who are not vaccinated so beds oxygen essential drugs for adults and that has to continue we have to stop crowding i think we should postpone uh, elections rallies and not have any gatherings wearing masks and maintaining distance has to continue for one more year now we have we need to take discuss and take a decision on how we are going to open schools if we are going to open schools is it going to be interrupted is it going to be continuous uh physical schooling or is it going to be online now these are this is the time to discuss all that so covid vocabulary we have learnt a lot we know what mutation is instead of talking about the virus i think we should mutate our behavior we should learn to wear masks we should quarantine and social distance not human beings but we should quarantine and social distance crowds crowding religious gatherings and elections i think we should accept wearing mask and maintaining distance as a new normal this whole lot of information more than 70% of it is misinformation so this infodemic correction has to happen we need to have positive messaging and we need to have messages that will change behavior not based on fear but balanced with uh, giving hope so i'll stop here i think i uh, that's the salient point <laughs> thank you sir we will uh, during the discussion hour we can take more questions and then respond sir thank you very much uh, uh sir uh, sir has been i think every day is addressing some panel uh, been very helpful in uh, dealing with this infodemic and uh, now i would request uh, my vice president uh, dr vijay lakshmi balakundari um we've been working together with ma'am for the last uh, 15 years or more um she is a very much this though she is a pediatrician cardiac pediatric cardiologist very much grassroot oriented very much public oriented ma'am it's a privilege to have you with us uh please uh, go ahead Vijay Lakshmi, madam, should be unmuted. Ma'am, please unmute. Jitin, unmute. Madam, we can't hear you.
Doctor, we are unable to hear you. Doctor, we are unable to hear you. Dr. Vijay Lakshmi, you could try removing your earphones and unplugging it from the system and then speaking. still unable to hear you. Ma'am, if you can remove your earphones and try, it will be good. Right? No, we can't hear you. Uh, Alvin, please repeat your instruction. Ma'am, uh, can you ask her to unmute, uh, no, remove the earphones and uh, try with the laptop audio? She was first doing the same thing and then she has put on the earphones. So I suppose the drivers are uh, uh, not performing well on her computer. Um, yes, ma'am. Ma'am, ma'am, drivers are not... Uh, please tell me somebody what to do. Well, that is a thing to be done inside computer. I mean, it is a, it is a long process. I don't think she... Um, so she'll have to update her drivers. Okay. The device uh, manager, she'll have to go to the device manager and then look for the drivers and then uh, uninstall them, install them, or e at least update them. That's so maybe maybe, the uh, she can join using her mobile phone for the audio. Yeah. She has yeah, that that yes, sir, that makes she sense. She can use her mobile phone to, uh, that's the better option. And the other option is uh, if uh, Dr. Anand Bal or Dr. Pratima wants to talk now, we can give uh, Dr. Vijay Lakshmi the time to organize this. If Dr. Anand would like to speak first, most welcome. Or I can speak. Dr. Pratima, you're, you said that Dr. Anand Bal is right. Yeah, I, I'm actually not going to be using a presentation. So Dr. Pratima can present. I'm happy to answer questions. Yeah. Uh, yeah. What I can do is perhaps uh, if Dr. Vijay Lakshmi is okay, she's still trying to talk. Um, no, she's still trying to talk. So if it's okay, maybe I will start and uh, you know talk, talk to you about some of the mental health issues that have arisen out of this pandemic. Uh, we know it's been a global problem. There's, it's been go global learning. Uh, not just from the physical dimensions of the problem, but also the mental health percussions. And uh, practically everybody has been affected. I think it would be very useful to trace the, you know, the whole uh, genesis uh, in terms of mental health distress from the last year until now. Uh, during the wave one, particularly during the lockdown, uh, I think what we discussed were the fears about the virus, the, you know, the infodemic, people worrying uh, you know, and misinterpreting symptoms that they had to in some ways a readiness fatigue because we probably, you know, uh, we had a lot of things we thought in place, uh, but, uh, you know, the, uh, it didn't really give us the extent of the enormity it was not revealed in the first wave. Uh, in the post-lockdown, of course, in the first uh, wave, there were reports of increased stress among people, we came to know about stress and mental health problems among all the frontline workers. 
Uh, there were also emerging reports of the effects of lockdown in terms of uh, uh, you know people making adjustments uh, in their day-to-day -day life. But more importantly, towards the end of the lockdown, towards the end of that uh, last year, we came to know about possible increasing uh, incidents of domestic violence at home, emerging problems among children, particularly emotional problems among children. Uh, certainly during the lockdown, a reduction in the use of substances because they were not available, uh, but an increase in alcohol-related withdrawal-related emergencies. Post-lockdown, of course, with the opening up of alcohol vents, there was an increase in alcohol intoxication-related uh, issues. Uh, subsequently, in the last year, we have been seeing uh, perhaps an uh, escalation of the panic and fear. And this time, the whole, in some ways, there has been a whole spectrum of mental health responses to the pandemic in the second wave. I'll start off with the more serious consequences, which has been grief following bereavement. I think this is something that a lot of people have experienced where they've lost a loved one, where they've not been able to stay in the hospital with the loved one, and more actually very significantly have not been able to participate in the last rites of their loved one. And that has been extremely traumatic to people who have undergone this. There is obviously a sense of grief and we all know that people go through different stages of grief. There is a shock and denial of the problem. There is a lot of anger towards, uh, you know, towards others, towards the system. There is what is called the stage of bargaining. And then there's a stage of despair and then the stage of acceptance. But grief is an overwhelming phenomenon. And I think with the grief is also the fact that the rituals that we have following grief, you know, how we all get together, we kind of share the grief, there is a closure. And that we are prevented because of the COVID pandemic. When you go one step, and to me, that is the most distressing thing that people have faced when I, I know colleague, a colleague who has lost both his parents to the pandemic and could not be there in the hospital with them. And that's extremely thing. There is also a tremendous amount of guilt that comes in such situations that people have to learn to deal with. When you go to the next step, it is about the illness. We know now that COVID you know, is, is kind of, uh, every, and lots of families have undergone it and multiple family members have also been infected. And then that can again cause a lot of worry, a lot of misinterpretation of symptoms, unsureness about when to test, what to test, what tests to do, whether to go ahead and get an, you know, a CT scan. So these are all tremendous things, what medications to take. There is so much uh, you know, confusion among people because they don't follow just the, you know, the scientific guidelines, but they tend to kind of get information from a variety of sources and that leads to problems. The second problem is about caregiving, especially when the caregivers in the family have to be hospitalized and there are young children at home and so on. And especially when caregivers, particularly parents, have, you know, have kind of uh, expired. We have an emerging problem of the COVID orphans. And you know, we have to look at, as a society, how we're going to deal with that. The third in the fi is the financial aspects of the crisis. And certainly, uh, you know, uh, financial distress. We, we've seen pro problems in terms of daily wage workers and how they're impacted. Uh, today, there was a DG of the railways who came in for a discussion and said that he has observed, for example, an increase in suicidality. And we know that one of the things that can happen when there is severe distress is an increase in suicidality, consequent to the emotional problems, to the financial problems, uh, to, uh, to, and to other various uh, aspects uh, in society. But these are the extreme parts of the spectrum. We must remember as we know from the first wave, that 80 to 85% of people recover without any major problems. Perhaps about 10% require hospitalization and it's about 5% who have severe forms of infection. I think one of the other things that has been changing is also that we have seen younger people being affected. So people in their prime being taken away and that can be very distressing to parents who are left behind. But moving back, to the situation for the 85% of us, the fear, the panic, 
Uh, and in some ways, the uncertainty is something that is a cause of a lot of stress for people. And this stress can manifest with sleep disturbances, with appetite disturbances, with feelings of sadness, loneliness, boredom, uh, stress, and panic. And that can be very troublesome, both from the mental health point of view as well as the physical point of view. In addition, we probably you know, also see an increase in the use of substances to deal with this kind of stress. There are certain groups of people who are extremely vulnerable, both to stress and of course, both to depression and anxiety, which are described as the common mental disorders as a consequence of, uh, uh, you know, of the, the tremendous amount of emotional difficulties during this period. I won't go into the symptoms of each of them, uh, but it's not, uh, one must understand that if you have symptoms over at least a week or two weeks is when you label them as common mental disorders and differentiate them from stress. The other thing that we have now are now hearing about is post-traumatic stress disorder. Particularly, we hear it among healthcare workers who have seen a lot of death and dying, families who've been through this trauma, people who've been in ICUs, etc., where they have constant flashbacks of the stressful event, they have episodes of panic, they have sleep and appetitive disturbances, uh, and a huge amount of agitation when they are reminded of the situations that they were in. Now, there are different kind groups of people who are extremely vulnerable. Of course, we've read about the increased amount of mental health morbidity among frontline workers. And it's among frontline workers, nurses are perhaps one of the you know, most affected uh, people especially young women nurses who have to deal with both their professional stress as well as the personal responsibilities they have at home. We know that there have been tremendous stress among the police who have to you know, manage uh, law and order. This time we are also hearing about stress among ambulance drivers who have to ferry sick patients who are doing much more of this, hardly going back to their homes. Crematoria workers who have to deal with a lot of, you know, and, and stage processes as far as people are concerned, daily wage workers. We heard Dr. Ravi mention in the end of his presentation about children perhaps going to be affected in the subsequent waves of the pandemic. So there are, already the children are at great emotional pressures with a lot, you know, with the work, with the being at home constantly, the lack of ability of, you know, playing with their peers, about worries and fears about separation and illness. So that's another group of uh, people who are vulnerable. The elderly are extremely vulnerable. In the last wave, it was about feeling lonely, feeling you know, neglected, and uh, you know, not being well connected, particularly if they were not digitally connected. But now with the elderly, there are fears of abandonment, there are fears of illness, there are fears of death, which have compounded uh, you know, problems for the elderly. Similarly, uh, pregnant women who are you know, extremely worried about the impact of COVID on both them and the unborn child and find it very difficult to seek services, uh, especially during the you know, antenatal period. People in correctional facilities where we know that when there are COVID outbreaks or in, people in institutions, they, these can also have huge consequences. But then how do we deal with this? I think the first and most important thing is to recognize that certain emotional responses are appropriate. They are there for some time. And then if you learn how to deal with them, they will actually subside. The second thing are the common things that we tell everybody, you know, proper diet, proper exercise in the limited you know, ways that you can do it at home, providing even though you, are, uh, you have to maintain physical distance, make sure you're connected with people so that you are supported and others are also supported, making sure you have access to the right kind of information but also some degree of COVID preparedness should you become infected, should you need to go into hospital so that your arrangements for care for yourself and for your near and dear ones is done. So some degree of pragmatism, but at the same time being able to be calm and to, you know, to kind of face challenges is a very important thing. So one is at the health level of self-help. The other thing is, of course, being aware of one's own stress threshold. And you know, there are some of us who can handle a lot of stress. Some people are very vulnerable to stress and therefore being aware of that and trying to see, uh, to avoid things that increase the stress. And one of the things, for example, is to constantly be bombarded with information and visuals that, you know, that are very, very depressing and that are very uh, anxiety triggering. 
The second is to learn to adapt to new situations and be resilient. And that's something that we have to learn. How do we you know, deal, deal with work from home? How do we deal with financial uh, stresses? How do we plan the day to day? Having a daily routine is possibly a very, very important thing. Uh, being in touch with one's thoughts, actions, and feelings is another thing that helps a person at an individual level deal with some of the stresses of, of the particular situation. Establishing routines is extremely important and particularly important now is having a good sleep routine so that uh, you know there is some degree of normalcy at least at a personal level that is restored. The other thing that people talk about more and more is compassion, kindness to yourself, kindness to others, and some degree of altruism in trying to help others and working towards this as something that in which all of us are together so that we can get out of it and you know helping people particularly in distress connectedness is something that i mentioned social connectedness managing uncertainty is very very important and perhaps that's a lot of people manage it in different ways haven't got time to go into those details but certainly that's very important and of course, I mean, you know, while recognizing that the, the severe consequences are there, we also need to recognize that this is something that is hopefully going to get better after some time. I'll, the last part I just wanted to mention, particularly since we deal with people with severe mental illness, this is another group of people who are extremely vulnerable at the time of this, these pandemics, both in terms of having an exacerbation of their symptoms because maybe they're not regular with their medication, also perhaps having even more impacts of loneliness, distress, lack of support, loss of family members. So this is another group that we need to look after very carefully. And finally, the group with chronic other chronic diseases, where particularly the non-communicable diseases where you know, hospital uh, visits are re reduced, their connection with their, uh, with their doctors are reduced. This is another group that needs support. So all of us need some degree of self-help and mental health support, there are people who are vulnerable who need even more support. And we need to develop networks to provide that kind of support, both uh, in a non-professional manner as well as in a professional manner. I'll leave you with those thoughts. Thank you very much. Madam, thank you very much uh, for this very useful thoughts. Uh, it is heartbreaking what we are going through. We desperately want uh, things to end as uh, soon. Uh, as I know, Nimans has been, uh, I think I worked in uh, the past, since 19, I worked in three major disasters in the globe and Bangladesh, I went over in all this and, and, and in tsunami and in Marathwara. So Nimans was with us, uh, giving this very useful uh, information support. Uh, indeed, uh, you and the department are very helpful, ma'am. So we hope to continue to look up to you. And then as we move on, how we put the really, really, it's very painful. No answers how we're going to help people are going through uh, severe trauma this post, you know, uh, in so many families. Uh, let's hope together, I think we can help as a society, uh, whatever way we could. So we'll move on to the next uh, presentation. Sorry for the inconvenience. Uh, Dr. Vijayalakshmi, ma'am, is there. Uh, over to you, ma'am. Audio again is not there. Audio? Again, your audio is a problem, ma'am. Jitin, can you help? Can you sort out ma'am's audio? Hello? Ma'am, your audio is not there. Can we take it later? I'll request Jitin to uh, help you. Uh, we'll uh, request Dr. Anand Man to come over. We are not able to hear. Thanks, Sandra. So, you know, again, an honor to be on the panel today, uh, you know, with such eminent uh, senior colleagues. Uh, I, I don't have a formal presentation, but just maybe some thoughts, you know, which I thought might help us uh, prime the discussion. One of the things I think which is relevant is sort of the background to the pandemic. You know, the pandemic is sort of a once in a lifetime. Uh, Anand, most of Anand our... one second, Dr. Anand. Uh, Dr. Vijayalakshmi, my apologies. Uh, we are not able to hear your audio. 
uh, I will request uh, Jitin. I'm requesting Jitin to help you sort out, ma'am. In the meantime, we'll go ahead with Dr. Anand, ma'am. I'm sorry for the inconveniences. No, what's happening? Uh, kindly bear with us, ma'am. Yes, Anand, over to you. Sure, sure. So what I was saying is that the pandemic is probably a once in a lifetime experience for most of us, but it tells us something and it tells us something very, uh, very much prominently about our health system and that uh, health system has been clearly caught underprepared. So as, uh, you know, as future health professionals, especially our body of volunteers, this is extremely important because this is something we need to address as a community. The fact that our health system needs to be more resilient, it needs to be better resourced. Uh, you know, over the last one and a half years of uh, dealing with the pandemic, we have all realized that there are several deficiencies in the health system, anywhere from epidemiology, you know, lab networks, surveillance, uh, capacity within the health system at various levels, primary, secondary, tertiary, uh, you know, and inability to have an adequate human resources. Often what you see is a lot of ICUs and ventilators are built up, but then where are the human resources to staff these kind of advanced facilities? And that's something you cannot create overnight. The fact that we could have learned from uh, last year's experience in, in sort of building that capacity better, but both, uh, you know, at various levels, both at the central and uh, state level, we've seen that being a failure there's not been uh, you know so a lot of hiring which happened was short term not long term in nature so i think that is something which we need to really talk about what can we do better and what is the the need for public health advocacy around that so that we have more resilient health systems the second thing i think which is important even for our volunteers is the realization that uh, while there's been so much explicit focus on covid 19 over the last uh, many months, uh, it's it's important to recognize that that has also had a negative ramification on non-COVID-19 care, and uh, that did happen last year. Then we had a slight bit of uh, you know a few months where there was some relief, but now we are again in a situation where everything is COVID largely, and you even have super specialty hospitals, tertiary referral centers, which are almost entirely focusing on COVID. So what does this uh, mean for those of our patients who require non-COVID care, whether that be long-term non-communicable disease care, that be dialysis care, uh, that be mental health care, that would be uh, you know anyone requiring surgical interventions which are non-emergency in nature, uh, tuberculosis, malaria, uh, a whole lot of other conditions which have probably faced a lot of setback. And I think that is also important to understand and uh, for the volunteers who will be working especially in community-based settings to try to figure out that if there are people out there who have undiagnosed or diagnosed medical conditions which might not be COVID related but still require care what is the pathway that we can build for them are there existing uh, referral mechanisms that we can leverage because of, obviously care for them is extremely important in fact with COVID right now one of the major issues also is going to be the rampant overuse of medications polypharmacy that we are seeing and that by itself is potentially going to put us in a situation with areas such as uh, antibiotic resistance you know beyond what we already have because uh, if you look at the kind of prescriptions which are being used right now uh, these are really troublesome many of them are not evidence-based um, many of them involve usage of multiple medications many of them involve usage of antibiotics sometimes more than one antibiotics many of them use steroids uh, and steroids certainly have a role to play, but you need to do it with supervision, etc. But the steroid misuse that we are seeing also has a lot of ramifications. And many of you would have also heard about one of the potential issues around uh, the spread of mucormycosis or the so-called black fungus, uh, which uh, we are already dealing with. So uh, that, I think, is certainly an important area to focus on, that what can we do in terms of getting better care for those you're going to be working with in the community, but also realize that there might be uh, non-COVID care requirements that we need to focus on. Perhaps the other thing to sort of talk about also is that our approaches in the way we deal with these uh, kind of uh, situations need to be thought through in cricketing terms more like a test match rather than a, a T20 response and often what we see from the policy circles is a response which is very much short-sighted and short-term uh, in basis and rather than building longer term capacity uh, in being able to do things better and if we had that right from the beginning perhaps we would have uh, done a better job 
the issue of misinformation, I think, is another one where uh, a lot of our volunteers, I think, would be especially relevant. There is a lot of uh, lack of understanding of COVID uh, in the community, especially in urban poor settings and um, in in our, in our uh, rural households. It's actually also true of uh, the better to do uh, financially uh, households as well, because there is so much information which is being shared via social media so the so-called whatsapp university as we refer to so people take uh, taking medications using steam using, using all kinds of homemade remedies with the belief that this will prevent covid or this is useful for covid treatment uh, the fact that there have been uh, medications which have been sometimes supported by government which have no uh, you know, no basis in evidence uh, at all, and these are still being widely used. The fact that there are some misconceptions around vaccination and vaccines, which need to be cleared. You know, there are some genuine concerns about vaccines, which hopefully we can also discuss today when the Q and A session happens. But it's very important, I think, for the right information to go out, uh, because in the absence of that, we will see uh, a lot of people probably accessing anything from testing. To, uh, to care late and we know especially with COVID uh, that someone can very quickly transition from mild disease to moderate, moderate to severe and I think time is of the essence. So that I think is another element which is really important to address. The link to that is also making sure that we have uh, situations and whenever we prepare for work in working with communities of thinking through the referral pathways, whether that be for transport of patients, whether that be for mental health referral where, where required, because you might be able to do same level of uh, primary counseling uh, uh, if you've been trained for that, but there will be individuals who will require specialized referral and you need to know and plan in advance for those kind of referral services so that you're able to leverage them. So I think whenever we think of volunteering, a lot of background work is extremely important. It's not just about going into the field, but also about preparing for that situation where you have the right information with yourself. You also have the right support systems. You have referral pathways built in. You have individuals you can reach out to, uh, which, uh, which is, uh, I think, really uh, important to address as well. So on the vaccine side, I think right now also there's going to be a fair bit of uh, confusion, especially because, you, as you know, there is a bit of a shortage of vaccines. There are these multiple pathways through which vaccines can be uh, obtained, either the state government, the central government, or private health systems. They have different pri price points. There are new vaccines going to come in. There are concerns around adverse events following uh, vaccination. There is uh, a lack of clarity on when vaccines will be available. So people are registering on the COVID platform, but yet not getting slots, etc. So I think just educating yourself also around vaccine vaccines and vaccination policy and what you can tell people so that they are a bit more reassured is extremely important, including on safety issues, including on dosing, including around how vaccines are being administered and why it is important to get vaccines. So I think if we build that uh, knowledge up within ourselves, we will be much better placed in being able to uh, respond to patient needs. The other thing I think which is probably quite relevant, especially because there's a lot of pharmacy students involved in the initiative, is helping uh, people understand the importance of uh, being careful with the with the drugs that they are ingesting. A lot of people are now taking yes, a lot yes. of medications over the counter. Some of those might have drug to drug interactions, and uh, as uh, pharmacy students who have expertise, uh, it, it's really important to look at that as well. Uh, from uh, from a patient education perspective. So I think I, it might be good for us to maybe discuss some of these. I know we have around an hour remaining. If uh, Dr. Vijay Lakshmi can speak, then you know I'd be happy to maybe explain things more during the discussion rather than spend more time uh, on my um, initial remarks. So Chanda, maybe back to you and then uh, we can take it forward. Yeah, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Anand. Uh, Ma'am, are you ready or we yeah. need some more time? No, ma'am, still we can't hear me. Uh, yes. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, ma'am. Please. Okay, okay. I'll, I'll go ahead. Thank you. Great, great. Okay, okay. Thank you. Over to you, ma'am. Yeah, but I get that. Okay. Sorry, everybody. Thank you very much for your uh, patience. And uh, I, I have a feeling. I'm a congenitally positive, pessimistic person, uh, optimistic person. So whatever happens, happens for good. So all the three speakers, Dr. Ravi, Dr. Pratima, and Dr. Anand, they have already laid the foundation. And for me, it is very easy to go ahead now. 
in the first wave, the whole world was worried because they didn't know anything about the virus and the 218 countries were shattered. And already Dr. Ravi has told you that it is a genetically engineered virus that came from Wuhan. And now we have already double mutant one. And what is worse, it is affecting the children more than the others. And here you have to see that all the Europe, North America total population is 1 crore 34,000, uh, 34 lakhs. And they have 87 prime ministers and we have 1 crore 39 lakh people and one person. And unless the whole country, the whole, every citizen of India joins hand and fights as a warrior, we are not able to defeat this corona. And Dr. Ravi has already told you about the genome and everything. But I would like to highlight here that this virus doesn't have wings or doesn't have the hands or legs to run or fly. It has to move from one person to another person. And what is important is it has got a capsule which has got a lipid capsule or the fat. And that dissolves in the uh, soap and also in the alcohol. And it has got a sugar molecule on the spike. And this sugar molecule, it camouflages this virus, almost makes it appear all like our own body cell. And as a result, our antibodies are unable to recognize which is a virus and which is the body cell. And that's how we know uh, it is like a terrorist which has come in the guise of our own people. And uh, this gets into the cells. And these spikes are very important. They act as a key to get into the cell. So once they stick into the nose, mucosa, or the throat, they go into the cell through this key. I mean, this uh, uh, spike acts like a key to enter the uh, cell. And as a result, this is so important that once you understand this mechanism, then you will realize why the doctors and the health people are asking you to wash your hands repeatedly and uh, also the uh, scrub. So here you can see that we have six steps to scrub and for 20 seconds you have to scrub because the soap will disrupt the lipid that is the fat the capsule and when you rub nicely uh, on the palm and the top and in between the fingers and the, uh, all these six steps, at this time, the spikes will break. And once the spikes break, that uh, virus cannot enter our body cell. And once the sugar is dissolved in the water, it is no more acts like a camouflage. And as a result, our body can recognize. So these are the three important things that everybody should understand the washing the hands is to disrupt the membrane of the uh, virus so that it becomes inactive. The uh, scrubbing is a uh, thing that is rubbing is important to break the spikes and then the water is important to dissolve the uh, sugar molecule. And here you must remember everywhere we may not have the soap and water and then we use the sanitizer. And the sanitizer has to have 70% alcohol and everything, including the mobile and the, anything that an infected person touches, that has to be sanitized. And the children, especially, they have to understand not only the washing the hands, when they are sneezing and coughing, they have to cover their face, brushing their teeth, and gargling every day, twice or thrice, is extremely important for the children. And unless we make it as a habit for them, uh, it is not possible to uh, inculcate good habits into them. Now, <clears throat> why are we asking the people to have the social distancing? One should understand the social distancing is asked because whenever a person is sneezes or coughs, at the speed of 106 kilometers per hour, millions of organisms, that is millions of coronavirus, are thrown out of the nose and the mouth uh, through the droplets. See, the IPL game also was cancelled because of uh, the corona. And you know, in IPL game, only one uh, bowler will be bowling at the speed of 90, 96, at the most 100. But here, 106 six, uh, kilometers per hour. And there, only one ball is there. So the batsman can hit a sixer or a four. But here, 
the opponent who is in front of you becomes sick within three to five days. And that's how it is very important to maintain the distance so that whenever you cough or sneeze, that droplet that is coming from the infected person doesn't uh, go to the nose, eyes and the mouth of the person who is in front of you. Apart from that, spitting in the public places is a very, very uh, bad habit that the Indians have got. Everywhere you see the people spitting and when they spit also, the infected person can throw crores and crores of virus outside. So the children should learn that spitting should not be done and that's how they have started punishing. Dr. Ravi already showed you that if both infected and uh, non-infected people they don't wear, it is like a wildfire it spreads. But when both infected person and non-infected person, they wear the uh, mask, uh, the nat naturally the infecting rate will come down. And here, most of the people I find either putting the dupatta or the kerchief. And remember, the kerchief or dupatta is not going to help at all because this will have a zero filtering of the virus when you wear the uh, matching uh, mask for uh, yourself. So it is more of a cosmetic purpose, but it doesn't scientifically help you. So if you want to really wear, you have to wear a surgical mask like this. And once you wear the surgical mask, you have to press here so that there is no gap between your uh, cheek and the asin. Uh, and when you want to remove, you have to put the fingers like this and remove without touching the front portion. Because the front portion is the one where there is a virus and each one of you should realize that without touching that the one you just remove it like this and when you come home put it into the Dettol or the Savlon uh, uh, water and then keep it for 15 minutes wash it and then you use suppose you are going into the high risk places where the crowd is too much then at that time you have to wear not one two masks when you wear two masks you have got a double uh, filtration and N99 and N95 masks are the best if you are having going to the hospital to see your relative and infected people are there around you or at home there is an infected person in quarantine. So you want to protect yourself. These are the masks to be used and not the cloth mask. And remember, wearing the mask is very important. On one side, the government is making enormous effort to control. So just from two virology centers, now we have 1,500 centers all over the country. And Dr. Ravi will agree with you that the virologists have contributed tremendously in controlling. But what's the problem with it? The people is, the people are not supporting. And remember, we cannot clap with one hand. Uh, so the government, as well as the people, the society, they have to work together. And here, especially in the second uh, uh, wave, more youngsters are affected, the deaths are more. And in the last 10 days in Karnataka, 6,800 children are affected. 6,800 is not a small amount, a small number. And especially when you go to the third wave, it is going to be catastrophic. And we always say the children are our future. And always the prime minister was proud about the young people. Now, if we lose the young and the children, what is going to be the future of our country? And hence, one should remember. In adult, everybody says the sore throat and the itching and the coughing. But in children, they may just have a fever and breathing problem. And they may not have the regular symptoms like an adult. But instead, they may present with the nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, and tiredness. So when the child says the loose motions or the a stomach ache, the parents tend to think that it is the food in the thing or the water contamination. And that's the reason they don't bring the child to the doctor. And apart from that, when the child says tiredness, they'll say that, oh, child has been uh, no school and jumping around and that's why it is tired. And that is how the children are missed and then they are not brought in time to the doctor. And another important thing is the most of the children are asymptomatic spreaders. They bring the infection and they spread it to the parents and the grandparents, or they get it from the parents, 
and then they remain in asymptomatic. So most of the parents, they take it for granted that the child is all right. And what is the most unfortunate thing is after two to three weeks, the child becomes suddenly very sick. It has vomiting, it has got tiredness, and then goes into the multi-system inflammatory syndrome. That means the child's immunity is low, but first time when there is a small viral load, the number of virus are less. At that time, it doesn't suffer. It is asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic. And suddenly after three weeks, the antigen antibody war starts. And at that time, all the organs in the body start getting affected. And especially here, uh, the adult, they always look at the lungs. But in children, the heart can have the problem with the viral myocarditis. Brain can be affected with the encephalitis or there can be diffuse uh, involvement of the, all the organs in the body. And hence, uh, this uh, multi-system inflammatory syndrome is very, very, very disastrous. And unless the government has already woken up, they are preparing the ICU for the children and they are treated on a war footing, saving the children becomes very, very difficult. And hence, it is important that any loss of taste or loss of uh, smell or loose motion, pain abdomen, especially the small intestine, the last portion is called as the ileum, that is near the appendix. And it appears almost like an appendicitis, but it is a corona. And hence, the high suspicion index is very important in children. And especially if any family member has got, one has to be very, very careful about it. So if the child gets infected, what should you do? Isolate the child. Isolating the child is very not very easy. The mother has to be there or the father has to be there. So one has to choose only one person must be with the child and the rest of them should be isolated separately. Otherwise, the whole family will be affected. We have recently seen that both the parents have died and the children have become orphans. And it is so sickening and so heartening. And my heart goes out to these little children there is no one to look after them. And as a result, it is very important to isolate. And if it is more than uh, two years old, um, if the, it is breathless, then oxygen can be given or the mask can be given. But what one thing people should realize that corona is going to damage much more if the person is smoking. So whether it is an adult or it is a child who has started uh, smoking, one should remember not to smoke and damage your lungs so that when the corona comes, your lungs are strong enough and they are not already damaged. And hence, smoking and alcohol must be kept away. And you might have seen in the TV that the moment the lockdown is announced, the people are rushing to the uh, wine shops to collect the wine. And they are having a wrong notion in the head that alcohol sanitizer can kill the virus so if they drink alcohol every day, it will kill. No, it is not going to kill the virus. It will kill you. And as a result, the smoking and the drinking must be uh, kept away. And more than 100 uh, uh, infected ladies have delivered. Fortunately, very few newborn babies have got the corona. Rest of them, only two of them, and rest of them are normal. And hence, friends, remember, the new it manners and etiquettes that we have to remember not to spit here and there, not to travel unnecessarily because this coronavirus travels along with the traveler. If the infected person is coming from America to India, the coronavirus is brought in his body because his body is like a tank of coronavirus. And as a result, unnecessarily traveling should be avoided. And touching the eyes, nose and the mouth, the children should learn uh, now, we tell in Canada, uh, that means your hand and the mouth must be clean. And that has to be taught to the children. And don't uh, unnecessarily indiscriminate. Many people, what they're trying to do is, uh, anybody is affected, oh, uh, he is positive, he is positive. So don't ill treat the person who is positive. Try to help them rather than uh, getting away from them. And social distancing at any time is extremely important. And uh, as Dr. Ravi said, right now, the uh, vaccine is given above the 18 years. But however, the trials are going on to give about 12 years. 
and soon we are going to get the intranasal spray and that too of the coaxin uh, from about two years. So that may take another few months and until then the children have to be taught. Remember those who have got the vaccine, the lungs are spared. Those who do not get vaccine, the lungs are totally damaged. Now the TV is showing the people are asking for oxygen, 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 oxygen everywhere. See oxygen is all round. It is like you know the, you are a, the sailor and all round there is a water but you cannot drink because it is a saline water. In the same way oxygen is there but the lungs are not able to take it and that's why the high pressure oxygen has to be given through the nose or through the mask or it has to be given uh, through the uh, endotracheal tube. And you must see that this is a 104 years old lady. She has uh, put so many plants, uh, more than 384 banyan trees which give high amount of oxygen. And she is capable of blessing even the president, the first citizen of India. And we have to learn and live from her, grow the trees and do the uh, take exercise. And here you can see that in the children, putting the mask or the oxygen food and treating is very difficult. So very important is every child in their childhood, they should learn yoga, dhyana, especially pranayama. When one starts doing pranayama, whether you are infected or not infected, with the pranayama, uh, you can in control your mind so well and your mind becomes very calm and even asthma, the symptoms also will come down. And what is more important is from Nimhans, from where Dr. Ravi and Pratima come, they have done the study. When 20 minutes OM is chanted, the limbic system blood supply comes down and the anger, the negativity and everything comes down. And as a result, the person starts feeling much better with that. So Kapal Bhati, I have tried it when I went to Manasar or Kailas Parvata Parikrama, when you you keep doing that kapal bhati, oxygen can be taken much more. So friends, to conclude, we must stop blaming each other and we have to start helping each other because the social uh, distancing is only for the body, but our mind should not be distant from each other. We have to see that we work as a team, whether the poor or the rich, the mother is not only there to protect the children, she has to protect uh, not only from the sunlight, even from the corona. And if a worker can take care of her children, why not the others? And stop aping at the West. Stop aping at the West because whatever the people did in that, uh, the enjoying the partying or the night club, that is the one which spreads. And especially in the theaters, it spreads. And uh, many speakers, including Ravi, went on telling that it is the religious and the political, more than the political and the religious, it is the theatres, it is the pictures which are destroying our youngsters. Not only they are showing the glorifying the smoking and in the closed compartment of the theatre, if one infected person is there, not three feet, the virus can float in the air throughout the theatre and infect all of them. And as a result, stop going. So do not inaugurate the third way by cutting the mask. Joe Biden might tell no mask for the Americans, but for Indians, the mask is a must. It is a must. Mask is the best vaccine and one should start wearing not one, two, and that to the surgical mask. And friends, instead of aping at the best, let us be Indians and do namaskara. When you shake hand, your infection goes to the other person and his... Uh, virus comes to your hand. Instead of that, the whole world is looking at India and this is the time to control. Let us wear masks for 15 days, double mask, each one of us, the coronavirus will come down because replication stops at 10th day and after that it doesn't. And during that time, if you don't spread the infection, instead of government asking the police to handle you and give a danda, Learn yourself the lesson that you are the soldiers. Each one of us has to be the corona warriors and control. Thank you very much for the kind and the patient sharing. Thank you. Um, thank you, ma'am. I would like to thank all the esteemed panelists, Dr. Ravi, sir. 
and um, Pratima ma'am, uh, Dr. Anand Ban, and then um, Dr. Vijayalakshmi ma'am. So thank you so much. Um, dear friends, they are with us. They are accessible to us. Anytime you have a concern, a question to ask them, uh, you need a guidance from them, any of the panelists, please, please reach out to us. Uh, we'll be able to connect uh, you with them or, or get an advice from them and pass it on to you. Uh, now uh, is uh, time for, uh, we'll take a few questions. If, we, if need be, we can extend it for a few minutes. Otherwise, uh, we will go on with the question. If Dr. Sunita is ready, you can give the questions to the panelists. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thanks so much. Uh... Dr. Vijay Lakshmi, thank you for inspiring us. You know, the four of you have made such a deep impact. And uh, what uh, uh, Dr. Anand was saying is extremely important. You know, as much as our enthusiasm is taking us there, we have to prepare ourselves because nobody is an expert in one specific area. And the questions that come, comes across the board. So I think that is exactly where we are investing the energy now in order to prepare the volunteers from across the board, right from you know, the, the condition to certain things about vaccination. But most importantly to say, if we don't know something, we don't know. We can come back, you know, not to make up answers. This is not an exam where hook or hook, we have to pass it. Uh, so thank you for uh, making all this happen. I think the first question is uh, to Dr. Pratima, uh, where one of the members who joined us, basically she's a, a headmistress at uh, Delhi Public School in uh, Sikandarabad, Mrs. Uh, Suma Banerjee. She wanted to know, Dr. Pratima, if there's a helpline uh, where people can reach out to your organization or organizations similar to yours. Yeah, there is a national helpline which is advertised, uh, you know, on uh, the pub pub public meet on, on social media as well. And this uh, psychosocial helpline, uh, you know, I, I understand uh, has received more than five lakh calls, uh, you know, and, and for various uh, things. A lot of it are queries about, uh, you know, where people can get to various kinds of resources. But now it is now expanding to also have a separate help, uh, uh, helpline for children, as well as a helpline for women. So, and in fact, this morning we had a discussion that perhaps we need uh, such a kind of help for a variety of other people as well. And uh, I know that the IMA and the Indian Psychiatric Society have a helpline for doctors as well, you know, so that uh, doctors and other frontline workers can also be helped. So there are certainly these, uh, these helplines. But I think it's also about creating local resources, you know, for example, educational institutions, uh, uh, workplaces. A lot of workplaces are trying to now create, a, you know, in, uh, support across the spectrum. So similarly, educational institutions uh, and other places need to need to do this uh, because a lot of it is simple self-help strategies. I'm talking from the mental health perspective, simple self-help strategies as to how you can make sure you, you know, you, you deal with situations in a pragmatic and a calm manner, but at the same time, don't give rise to panic and thing and support people who are in any kind of distress. Today, the, the person in the Rotary Club was mentioning that, uh, you know, their volunteers, and I'm saying this because Sunita, you mentioned earlier about the training and Anand also mentioned that, that if they're not properly trained and also not properly able to handle the kind of emotional pressures of providing this kind of support, they can be overwhelmed. So today, apparently, the the, work, the people in the in the war room they were inundated with calls, and the you know there were members of the public. If things didn't go right, were actually piling on to the people who were providing the counselling, and that's you know that can be very traumatic. So I think training and being able to handle this is equally important. Thanks. Thank you so much. Uh, so the next question is about clarify the misconception of deaths due to COVID-19 vaccination. So just checking who would be uh, able to take that question. Uh, the misconception of deaths due to COVID-19 vaccination. Dr. Anand, do you think you would want to start, Chair? Sure. So maybe I can start and, you know, the other experts can kindly maybe add on. So, uh, you know, one has to recognize that uh, the vaccines are relatively new, but it's also true that many vaccines have been given out uh, all across the world, including in India. And the vaccines are largely safe. You know, there's one thing we can certainly say uh, with a certain uh, level of confidence that given the literally millions of vaccines which have been given out, that these are largely safe. Uh, it's unlikely that there can be a death attributed to the vaccine, but there is always a rare chance that there could be a serious adverse event and these are typically called adverse events following immunization 
and perhaps even deaths. You know, as you would have all heard, there have been issues around, say, clotting uh, with some of the vaccines, and there have been, uh, you know, uh, these descriptions abroad. Uh, you know, some people might have allergic reactions to uh, some components within the vaccine. Some of them might have pre-existing comorbidity, which might uh, be, a, be a factor, etc. So I think what is extremely important, one, is to reinforce that vaccines are very safe. That having been said, it's also important to recognize that there could be rare circumstances, that there could be adverse events following immunization. What is important is to for these to be cataloged and for these to be responded to so that uh, we know uh, what is the uh, you know the prevalence of these kinds of uh, events happening and then also these people should be provided immediate care so what is also important is for uh, for our volunteers when they talk about vaccines to let folks in the community know that it is important to uh, keep a lookout for any adverse events or any side effects that they're seeing following immunization typically anyway after covid-19 vaccination you're supposed to stay for 30 minutes for observation, which is when most of the immediate, uh, uh, you know, reactions will happen, especially anaphylactic uh, reactions. But beyond that, if you start seeing anything which is uh, a serious side effect, that you should access uh, medical care immediately because most of these can be addressed at that level. Uh, so I don't. I think it'd be fair to say that vaccines are safe, but there can be a rare circumstance of some kind of an adverse event, including potentially death. But, uh, you know, it's not something to worry about at the population level. We should keep a track on these as we give more and more vaccines. Uh, Sunita, what, yes. what happens is uh, any intervention for that matter, any intervention in medical field has its own risk. And always we weigh risk versus benefit. And when you consider that risk versus benefit, the vaccination outweighs the benefit far, far, far more than anything else. So therefore, and uh, now we say that vaccine is safer. Nobody can say that's 100%, uh, probably God alone you know, has to you know, bless us and say, yes, I know what it can be. But certainly the risk is very, very less. Thank you. And that, uh, that you know, it should be reassuring most Almost the risk are... is 0.0002%. So that safe is our vaccine. So the yeah. follow-on question... Sorry, okay. Yeah, say, okay. probably traveling in Bangalore one kilometer is much more riskier in a general sense than taking the vaccine, understand? <laughs> <laughs> and we have survived it, so we are fine. <laughs> We lived in Bangalore for far too long. Uh, anyway, uh, the follow-on question was, when there are comorbid conditions, like the diabetes, hypertension in the elderly, is it okay for them to go ahead with the vaccine? Yeah, in fact, the people with the comorbidity, like hypertension, diabetes, and the smoking, and the asthma, and uh, those who have undergone bypass surgery or angioplasty, these are the people they are more prone for the morbidity and mortality. Hence, they must take vaccination much more. And that is the reason our Prime Minister in the first itself, uh, he said that the corona warriors along with the senior citizens, because they are at a higher risk. Because if you compare, to take the mortality rate is 1.02 in the general population, whereas in the corona warriors, it is anywhere between 10 to 15 uh, percent and hence they have to take one only one thing is if they are taking the blood thinners like aspirin or clopidogrel or anticoagulant and then after the injection they have to press that area for about five to ten minutes so that there is no hematoma no bleeding otherwise absolutely safe and no need to stop any drugs uh, any questions about dr sunita or there Sorry, there are questions so there are lots of questions. So what do we do with the time? Because we are supposed to stop at 5.30 and we are full of questions. Uh, see, I would like to ask uh, Dr. Pratima once, you know, but, but I see um, she, the, the, along with Dr. Pratima, the mental health experts came and appealed to the media. I see still they're paying a major problem. What they are showing, the crematorium scene, the hospital scene is causing a lot of trauma to the people who are tested positive. That's when they are not seeking help, you no, know, to motivate them. Uh, what can we? They rightfully came early and appealed to the media. Please don't do that. But 
I don't think they seem to have stopped it. Uh, what can we do? This is a major barrier for us to go into the community, uh, encouraging uh, even people who are not tested positive, and even those who are tested positive, big challenge now in the context of this uh, saturation of information. Ma'am, what shall we do? I mean, I think it's not fair to vilify anybody. I mean, I think everybody has a responsibility. And I think there is a lot of media which also is responsible in terms of the way reporting is done. But I think the most important thing I believe is uh, in addition to showing up the difficulties and challenges that people say, the restoration of a practical uh, you know, ways of getting help, optimism, are very, very crucial. So I think balancing out difficulties, the challenges that we face, which are real challenges, along with ways of overcoming these challenges and getting help appropriately and sharing stories of the 85% of people who actually do you know, get better or home care, which people get, uh, get better. I think these balances are what need to be done across the board. And I think that's true for all of us. Uh Dr. Pratima, just extending that a little bit. For example, uh, one of the slides uh, that Dr. Ravi had shown, you know, how, how the chances of uh, uh, transmission reduces when both people are wearing masks and there is social distance. So if those could be the DP pictures on WhatsApp, or you know, somehow we want to start promoting the, the visual effect of that. And also what you just said very aptly, 85% of the people are getting better. We are forgetting the 85%. This is not even glass half full. This is glass eighty five percent full, but we somehow forget that. Uh, yeah. So the, the positive messaging. How do we how do we reinforce that? Sunita, one of the I think the most important things, and I think uh, both Dr. Ravi and Dr. Ban alluded to that, is that we forget these basic importance. Uh, especially the public. I mean, I think both in you know just wearing masks. If you actually go around, you'll find that somehow. Finding people for not wearing masks, I don't know how much it has helped, but people don't wear masks appropriately. They've got their masks below their mouth. There are, you know, there are people playing on the on the road because it's, uh, you know, it's it's a free time, and they, they really this the understanding of the seriousness, the potential seriousness of this particular thing, the understanding that if I am infected, that I will. You know, I, what I need to do is just isolate so that it prevents, you know, the entire community. So this kind of work, community is working together, I think can only happen in smaller groups. I mean, at one level, you can give public messaging, but I think certainly local communities need to get together and, you know, spread these messages and have some way of communicating. And I think that's missing in, even in our basic way of man, you know, managing our own health uh, care. I think we... so. And, and in fact, local communities have actually been very successful, uh, I know in some places, even in accessing care when it's necessary for the people in their community. So better organization, better information sharing, better COVID appropriate behaviors, as well as better networking, I think is very, very important. And, and I think for larger public health to actually develop you know, well in our country, we need to start a variety of these efforts, uh, including of course, you know, um, strengthening our uh, systems. Like you said, Dr. Sajima, because uh, we are looking at community participation finally. From Alma Atta, we have been talking continuously. I think now we have a once in a lifetime uh, opportunity to uh, make this a community center. There is a question on post-COVID issues or what is it that needs to be, uh, you know, what should people be aware of after they have been discharged from the hospital? What are the precautions they need to take? What else do they need to be aware of? Dr. Vijay Rashmi, would you like to yeah. take that? Yeah. Uh, Dr. Ravi is not there? Yes, Dr. Ravi sir is there. Sir, uh, if he wants to speak, it's okay. Otherwise, I'll take up that question. It's about post COVID, right? Yes. yes. Yeah. We should realize, uh, I think Dr. Vijay Lakshmi very beautifully said about children. Remember, the serious uh, multi-system inflammatory syndrome occurs two to three weeks after COVID, number one. So the story doesn't end with the acute illness of COVID. We all know that there are many, many complications of COVID that occur two to three weeks later. So people who have recovered from COVID need to be 
very very uh, vigilant of any new symptom they get cardiac we know there are many complications strokes because there is uh, clots that go to the brain people have had pancreatitis and they have developed diabetes people have a kidney injury and they have developed uh, renal failures in children multi so i think post covid care we did start clinics at the end of the first wave and as anand said non covid uh, was neglected so once we uh, started opening up and the first wave subsided then non covid there was a lot of rush so people stopped attending to post covid care clinics right now in the news what is very very uh, alarming is about the black fungus and that is a post covid uh infection especially in people who are diabetics and who have had steroid therapy so i think there are many uh things that we need to communicate that even after you recover from covid you can have complications so you need to seek medical help yeah. not to alarm people but to make them aware that you need to seek medical assistance i think dr ravi has put it very well and everybody is talking about the uh, lung involvement and the ct and the capping the price of the ct but what people are forgetting is whatever pneumonia has occurred now even if the virus stops growing and then they come back home they can heal by fibrosis and then they can become breathless later on and those who have not uh, had any thing especially youngsters this corona virus they can go and damage the inner layer of the blood vessels and cause the thrombosis as dr ravi told and that can cause heart attack in these people and on children they have the myocarditis where the muscle is damaged and in the youngsters the heart attacks have become very common and if the blood vessels going to the brain they get thrombosed and they can have the uh, stroke also and as a result the not only stress the stress induced even pancreatic induced diabetes are uh, more uh, prominent and as a result don't be happy that 85 percent people are recovering but out of that 85 percent how many of them have got the irreversible damage is not known and that's the reason one has to be very careful post covid one has to keep in mind and they have to involve themselves in pranayama breathing and do the uh, um, surya namaskara when vitamin d is there and this vitamin d along with others can help them to recover faster in addition let me just add in terms of the neuropsychiatric sequelae uh, dr rabujalakshmi mentioned strokes you can also get other psychiatric uh, disorders uh, manifesting the novo also there's something called long covid where people can continue to have symptoms of fatigue uh, extreme degrees of lethargy for so sort of many months after covid so i think these are things that people need to know about some of them have got the memory lost and concentration all those problems are there uh doctor there are lots of questions but when i look at them uh, most of it has been answered by one of you during your presentation but the one that uh, would be very important for us is uh as volunteers when we are uh, supporting and motivating the quarantine patients but mainly the caregivers at home what are those golden rules that we have to follow in what we tell them about the do's and don'ts because there are a lot of things that i see on the on the guidelines for example one of the guidelines says put all the uh, masks and infected things into a plastic bag and leave it in the sun for 72 hours before it is handed to the uh, garbage collector or they say something like um, you know for 72 hours Uh, let's say in the village, you know there are dogs around, there are rodents around, there are other kids around who can go and touch it out of uh, inquisitiveness. So it's not like we have these wonderful uh, isolated places where you can leave that. Uh, the other thing that is constantly said is if one person is infected in the family, then make sure the bathroom is consistently clean uh, and disinfected. Now uh, the issues to do with uh, you know uh, the, the money for the disinfection as well as if the person is running 20 times because of diarrhea. how do you keep people safe please go ahead yeah so this is these two are very very important 
and those volunteers and the what to say like the corona warriors working with the uh, patients who are highly infected not only the wearing the mask they have to wear the face shield also because even through the eyes the infection can go so the face shield is very important and there is no need to throw your mask here and there you can just i showed you how to remove it from the ears and without touching the front part you dip it in the uh, sarlon or the detol soap for about uh, soap water for 15 to 20 minutes and then put it for drying and within uh, half an hour the whole uh, thing becomes dry and you can try that it is not so instead of throwing here and there better to dip it in the uh, antiseptic thing and uh, another thing uh, you said about the toilet is if they have a one separate toilet for the infected person that is extremely good because we are all the time talking about what comes out of the nose and the throat the mouth is as a droplet but what we are not worried is there is a shedding of crores and crores of virus through the intestine because 22 feet intestine is affected especially the ileum and the shredding of the virus is through that so even the pl uh, platers or the stools they themselves can be infected and that's why after the toilet the person who has used not only should close the commode and flush it and wash the hand not 20 seconds 30 seconds and better to have the uh, foot controlled uh, tap so that instead of uh, turning the um, uh, knob and then washing and again turning I, that can be infective and apart from that the toilet sanitizers are there if you don't have many toilets now you have got the scrub which can uh, sanitize the commode the top and everything and that also can be used so not only the uh, toilet and the bathroom sanitization the commode sanitization flushing and the hand wash everything is very important dr sunita we have to definitely stop. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. I, I get the... Any more questions or uh, we will give a one um, few seconds, maybe one second, 30 minutes or 30 seconds, sorry. Uh, 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 the there, final uh, remark by the there. panelists will close or yeah. is there any, for any uh, persistent questions? No, Chanda, what, what we can do, Sunita can uh, sort out all the questions and uh, relate it to our, uh, you know, the panelists and send them on the, uh, you know, over the email ID. Yes, and sir. if you have the contact number and you can uh, give them and so that and they can even uh, know, reply them if needed. So that everybody gets a chance to talk to them at their leisure. Even the voice are good, so if you don't have to, you know, you can type it. Uh, sending voice notes is better because then we can make a repository of these things so we can go back and listen to it. Uh, what we are doing is basically recording all of this, making it available as a resource so that anytime we feel we need to go back and listen to what one of you has said, it will be easily available for us. So, so that will be good. Uh, uh, any, any, yeah. need to ask any question, the, there is a forest, we just close. close. Look, I said there are still a whole, whole lot of questions, and most of them revolve around home quarantine. Dr. Ramesh suggested, uh, since in uh, view of a time constraint, I think I would request the panelists to the final remark, you know, a concluding remark, is one minute, and then uh, we will close it formally. And then definitely we will uh, um, thank everyone, and we will reach out to then answer uh, you know, with with the answers to all the parts and the questions they raised. Yes, over to whoever, no, ma'am, the final remark. Dr. Ravi first. Yes, sir. Um, thank you for having me on the show. I think we are a long way off uh, from uh, protection, another year at least. Please use social vaccine and the physical vaccine. Both are essential. Be responsible, avoid crowds, avoid closed spaces. I'm sure we can get over this pandemic. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. And my final message is, anyone who is infected, after getting infected, being positive, if he roams around, that means he's not only committing suicide, he's committing homicide. So better to quarantine and don't move around. That is the first and the foremost thing. And the second most important thing is, 
Stop blaming the people, especially the doctors and the staff who are working round the clock. They are, I mean, you know, it, it is unimaginable the amount of pressure they are working with. And one idiot comes and tells, uh, um, there is no corona, people are making fuss and only they killed my, doctors killed my son. See, this sort of irresponsible things should not be shown. And the doctors are, uh, in fact, you know, sacrificing their family and their life. And yes. they are under tremendous pressure with respect to the people who are trying to help you. And that is the second thing. And the third thing is, stop blaming the government. The government is making a stupendous uh, effort, uh, not getting oxygen and uh, dying because of uh, lack of oxygen. No, the death is there because of the lung damage and they are not capable of taking. The ventilators are not going to help you. The oxygen is not going to help you. The prevention of the lung infection by corona is the only one which can be saved. That is, prevention is better than cure. And just because vaccine has come, when the vaccine came, they started saying, oh, this is the Indian vaccine, there is no study. And now suddenly they are all rushing for the vaccine. Remember, vaccine is like a helmet. It only prevents the head injury to some extent, but it doesn't prevent the accident. So to prevent the accident, you have to go slowly or keep the distance, wear the mask. The real vaccine is wearing the mask, keeping the social distance, and maintaining the uh, health and the hygiene and changing your lifestyle. And every one of you is a soldier and you have to fight against the corona and stop blaming the people for uh, unnecessary things. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, I was going to next, Dr. Anand or uh, Dr. Fatima, ma'am? I'll go yes. Dr. Yes, Anand. Thanks, Dr. Anand. Yes, I just, I just like to say that it is certainly expected that there will be a mental health, uh, a, fl a flux of mental health problems and people talk about a mental health pandemic following the COVID-19 pandemics. But I think the most important thing is not to be, to not to panic, but to be prepared and uh, not to, uh, to be able to help oneself, but at the same time know how to reach out for help and recognize what are common, you know, common emotional responses to a stressful situation like this, learn how to manage that. But at the same time, if it becomes very difficult or if there are, you know, there's a mental health crisis or there are severe mental health problems to reach out for help, there are various kinds of helplines for psychosocial help, for emotional help, for, you know, tobacco and alcohol help, you know, variety of things. So please reach out and develop resilient communities so that we can go through this effectively. Thank you. Yeah, you know, again, just to add on, I think, uh, you know, first of all, a lot of appreciation to all the volunteers who are stepping up to help out. I think if we have, uh, you know, a workforce like you, all of you involved in the response, we'll probably be better equipped. Uh, it's extremely important to remember that, uh, you know, Information is probably our best ally in our response. So if you can keep yourself updated on the do's and don'ts and a lot of that we've already discussed today, that would be great. Have mechanisms of reaching out where, wherever you have doubts so that you can clarify them and ensure that you pass on the right information. I think as Professor Ravi said and all the other panelists reinforced, if we follow just the public health precautions, we know these work. Make sure that you also help people make decisions around what is appropriate, what is not. Uh, you know, there is now enough evidence, for example, to indi indicate plasma therapy might really not be useful at all. There's been large studies which have shown that it has hardly any use, um, either from a clinical benefit or a mortality perspective. So if you can also help families who are sometimes just struggling with decisions and might not have uh, access to information, uh, that would be really great. And, and, you know, remember, all of us are learning. This is a new disease. Uh, so it is also important to stay on top of the information and uh, hence act uh, accordingly. But uh, once again, you know, all appreciation to the volunteers because, uh, you know, this might seem like an onerous task, but, uh, you know, all your work will be really very beneficial to the communities that you work with. Thank you so much. Yes, uh, thank you, Dr. Anand. So I would like to take this opportunity to thank you, the MN and panelists. Uh, they are busy actually around the clock. Yeah, everyone, I know them personally that they are connecting to many programs. They're trying to reach out in their own way to help you know, uh, the, all of us to deal with this pandemic. 
So I really want to thank each one of Dr. Ravi. Thank you so much, sir, for accepting our invitation, being with us, and then helping us. And then I would like to thank uh, uh, Dr. Ravi Lakshmi, ma'am. Thank you so much uh, for your uh, constant support, and then you will continue to guide us. And I would like to thank uh, Dr. Pratima, ma'am. Um, she's also very busy. She helped us to um, get Dr. Ravi on the on, on the panel. Thank you so much for that. And ma'am, I would like to thank you so much. And we need definitely there is a lot to do in your area. I think my guest, we have to do. And um, uh, I'm working in Ramnagar district. Now Sunita is working in Chamraj and with a volunteer group of volunteers. And uh, we will come to you for the help of how to deal with the mental health area. So we'll come back to you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Anand, for you. Uh, the public health is important. Anand, one thing, one question I've, I've been asking, even today I was asking in other group is also, the whole focus in firefighting, mopping the floor, when are people going to focus on turning off the tap? It means we also have to, the whole, uh, the, our uh, tertiary secondary care system is uh, overburdened, uh, pressurized. We need to reduce, means we need to strengthen the preventive care so that more people are not coming to that level. Home quarantine, a lot of challenges are there. Uh, we will look up to you, to Dr. Anand, to help us uh, from the power, strengthening our public health action part also. Uh, especially thanks to Dr. Sunita for uh, uh, the Q&A session managing it. And uh, above all, I would like to thank uh, our tech person this evening, um, Sir Jitin, who was helping us um, in the background, preparing for this, everything, the YouTube streaming and all the testing and everything, connecting with our panelists, testing everything. And he's a jack of many trades. Thank you, Jitin, for uh, your uh, app help. Uh, and thank you. Thank you, one and all. Uh, Dr. Sunita, final words. Sorry, uh, this is just one very simple request. Uh, we are all working in different ways. And uh, for example, in uh, Chandra, in, uh, in the Mysore district with uh, seven gram panchayats, uh, we are working as a group of us from Gram, which is the NGO and reaching out for home quarantine and uh, also the discharge uh, patients, you know, when they return home, that one week of intensively taking care of them by calling them up as well as the psychosocial support in terms of food packets, etc. So preparation of those materials, if I may kindly request you to take a look at what we come up with, because uh, it is also about you know, bringing in the community itself. So we are working with the ASHA workers, with the field workers, uh, in getting, you know, what is realistic because we can't tell them, uh, quarantine them with one room which has an attached bathroom. That is not going to work in the village setup. So based on such things, uh, it would be really nice if the those of you who have gathered decades of experience, if you can just browse through those five pages, I should make five pages that comes out because this is like a pilot test. And if we can get this right with the help of all of you, then when that starts to roll out into the COVID uh, task force at the Gram Panchayat, then the IAM person was here, they are working in Tumku. Uh, Chandra is working in Ramnagara. So we are all working through those community-centric spaces where it would be really nice to have experts that could take a look at what we come out as a final five-page document, which will then be handed over to the COVID uh, Gram Panchayat task force, and then they will be taking it forward from there. Uh, please, may I... Uh, you know, uh, get some assistance there because that kind of, uh, what do you say, this is no body fight. Thank you. And it will not be onerous on you because we're not expecting you to be a part of the whole two months process. It's a part of, uh, you know, three final stage. Only then once we get your input, then we finalize the document. And it will be a five-page document. Nothing uh, major about that. Thank you, Dr. Sunita. So uh, we started this uh, webinar with Dr. Ramesh's uh, in his opening remarks, sir. We will close it with your uh, final word, uh, sir. Oh. Thank you, sir. Over to you, and we'll close with your final words. Uh, thank you, Linda. This is exactly what I said. Each uh, one of our citizen has to uh, put their best foot at this juncture uh, to help the suffering of humanity. And that's exactly what our society is doing. I'm very happy. And with you, I know with the panelists and all the other coordinators and what they are doing. All the best, and and uh, I hope we will we will conquer this uh, pandemic at some day, and which is which will be very short. Thank you so much. Once again, thank you all. Let's continue thank the good you. work.